Hello everyone and happy Friday. Welcome to Art History with me. My name is Becca and today we are going to be talking about the Italian Renaissance, specifically the High Renaissance and later um, in the time period. Um, if you are new to my class, I always start with telling you kind of what supplies we're going to use for our project later. Um, so how the class usually works is I do a lesson where we talk about art history and then I do a project towards the end. Um, the project we're going to be doing is we're going to be making something called fresco paintings and you will learn what a fresco painting is. Um, as we get going, let me get my Q&A box. If you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box. I'm seeing some familiar names. Hello, hello, welcome. Welcome to art class with me. This is a new time, so I'm glad you're still able to be here. So what we need today, we need, um, uh, we've got oil. So we're gonna be making fresco later. So I've got this recipe um, and, and you hopefully got it in the, the sign up email. Um, so you're all prepared, but we're gonna need one cup of flour, a half a cup of salt, um, half a cup of water, and you're gonna need a bowl to mix it in with a spatula. I've got this little guy, um, something with a nice flat edge is good. Um, and then you're going to need watercolor paints. This is my watercolor paints. They come out of these little tubes. Um, and then you're going to need paint brushes for your paints and some water for your paints our watercolors and then you're going to need like a just a paper just a paper plate like this um i chose a nice big one so i had lots of space on it so something like that and that is the supplies you are going to need um someone said are we making clay sort of it's sort of like clay but it's not going to be clay it's going to be a little bit different um we're actually going to make paintings on uh, the, the clay that we make, something like this. So this is a painting that I made a few days ago. Um, so it, it had time to harden and dry. Oh, that's funny, the green screen is catching the leaves and making them transparent, but this is, this is the painting. So we're gonna make paintings. All right. Um, put that away. So those are our supplies. That's what we're gonna need for today. We got oil, salt, flour, water, a bowl, something to stir it with. We got water, we got watercolor paints, we got paintbrushes. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about these tools over here that I have. Um, you don't actually need to have them. Um, I just have them there to talk about. And with that, we'll get started on um, the history of art and we're gonna talk about the Renaissance now. So, let me open up my pictures. Someone said I don't have a paper plate. Um, you could use a cardboard box. Um, really, you just need a shallow kind of dish that you can throw away. So something not like a real plate. Um, you could use like a cereal box and you could cut it open and so you have like a nice like, kind of paper dish. Um, yeah, something along that one. Or you could even get maybe a cookie sheet and put some like aluminum foil in it. Um, Yes. Alrighty. So we're gonna get started on our lesson. I'm gonna open up my pictures so that you can see what I'm talking about. And so the Italian Renaissance, or the Renaissance in general, um, was a period in, of art that happened after the medieval period. And the medieval period and history was kind of a dark time. There was something called the Black Death or the bubonic plague. And it was this disease that um, killed millions and millions of people. And it was, um, it was a hard time for the people that were living in that time because um, the, the governments were always changing. There was a lot of war and things just weren't very stable. And, um, you know, like making money, taking care of your family. It was a hard time to be alive. And the Renaissance is uh, right after that. And it's kind of where things started to stabilize again. It's where people started to have um, a good steady income source. It's where uh, the, the 
death and the plague uh, went away. And um, so things just started to get a little bit better, a little bit brighter. Um, and in the Renaissance, they looked back to the classical period of Greek and Roman art, which came before the medieval period. And they were looking at their values, their traditions, their laws, their government, um, and they were looking at their art and they were seeing how could they could incorporate those things back into their time period because that was a time, the classical period was a time of um, a lot of create and a lot of good things. So they were trying to bring that back into, uh, back into their time. They wanted to get away from the medieval darkness. So um, this is a map of a couple specific areas that I'm going to talk about. So Florence is important and Rome is important. So the pink arrow is pointing to Florence and the blue arrow is pointing to Rome. And I like to study history because I it kind of teaches us a lesson about um, what happened before and it can help us to um, not make the same mistakes. And it can also teach us really cool things about what happened before. And, you know, we don't have to figure it out all by ourselves newly. We can take the lessons from history and apply them to our lives and not have to um, make those same mistakes. And someone is asking if the bubonic plague is like the coronavirus. It's quite different. Um, kind of, you know, it was this big sickness that did spread across the land and millions of people died. Um, but is it, it was different symptoms and it wasn't as treatable. And if you got it, you, you didn't really recover. So it was, it was a darker period, but the Italian Renaissance did come out of it. And so this is a good thing. All right, so um, here we are in Italy, in Florence and Rome, okay? And so we're gonna get started. So the medieval art um, was a lot, was very religious and it wasn't as realistic looking. So on the left here, we've got a picture of when uh, baby Jesus in the Catholic religion was born. And here he's, he's lying in a, a manger. That's where he was born. And you can kind of see that the, the real lifeness of this picture is not, um, is not like super real. But then on the right hand side, that is a painting by a Renaissance artist named Raphael. And you can see how real and how lifelike um, the Renaissance painting is. And that technique is called naturalism. So the Renaissance is kind of marked by, they were looking at how to make their art more lifelike and more real. So in this painting that Raphael made of Mary and her baby Jesus and his kind of being born. Um, this is much more lifelike, I would say. And here is another example of a medieval statue and a Renaissance statue. So the statue on the left is of uh, Mary holding Jesus after he um, dies. And the one on the right is the same exact um, story from the Bible. But you can see the one on the right. This is by an artist named Michelangelo, and we're going to talk a little bit more about him in a bit. And this is much more lifelike. And that his statue is actually made out of marble. So it's a very hard rock. And he just managed to make it look very real and very lifelike. And that's another good example of naturalism and how they were trying to make their art look like the real thing. Whereas on the left, they were trying to tell a story and, um, you know, they tell the same story. It just doesn't quite have the same effect. All right. And here is another uh, painting. So the, again, the one on the right, that is by a Renaissance artist named Da Vinci. And this is called The Last Supper. And the painting on the left, that is also The Last Su Supper, but that is a medieval painting. So the you can just see the naturalism and the realism of the paintings, big change, big difference um, between these two periods. So this is kind of why the Renaissance was so cool is because they just developed all these new 
skills and these new techniques that they were applying to art to make it look like the real thing. It was almost like a photograph. Um, and it was just very um, advancing forward in, in their skill set. All right, so now I'm going to talk to you um, about, this is the, the Vatican. And the Vatican is important because in the Italian Renaissance, um, the church actually commissioned a lot of the art and the this is the Vatican it's in Rome um, but also during the Italian Renaissance uh, governments and wealthy families also started to purchase art and so because of that there was a lot more art um, in the medieval period the really the only people that purchased art were um, was the church but moving into the Renaissance the church and uh, wealthy families and governments were able to afford and purchase art to make their their homes and their cities uh, prettier places. So here in the Vatican, this kind of whole complex, it's a lot of different buildings make up the Vatican. Um, and up there, kind of in the middle, that is a, a little red circle. That is the Sistine Chapel. So that is one chapel in the Vatican, and that is where the new popes are elected. And then on the right hand side, that circle, that is the, the Pope's residence. Um, he's the head of the Catholic Church. And um, that is where, where he lives. So I'm gonna show you some artwork from inside those buildings. And someone's asking if they need to mix, Milo's asking, do I need to mix my stuff together right now? If you don't need to mix it right now, we're gonna do it together at the end. Okay, so we'll just pay attention to the history lesson right now and um, that way we we can all do it together at the end okay so this is the Sistine Chapel and if you were with me on my class earlier this week um, we, we talked a lot about the Sistine Chapel and if you want to that that class should be uploaded to our YouTube channel right now so if you didn't get to see it um, I, I recommend you going and watching that but the, the Sistine Chapel um, is a really amazing building and the fact that he painted the entire ceiling um, and this is done by Michelangelo uh, and and he did a really good job of making it look really lifelike he made the pictures kind of pop out at you and look like they were real and look like the guys are floating down from the ceiling or they could reach out and grab you from the ceiling um, and so he just did a really good job of naturalism and just making it look very real and lifelike and how he painted this was with uh, fresco painting. So fresco is what we're going to do today. And fresco simply means that there's something called plaster, and it's kind of like mud, um, that they would smear on the walls to make them flat and even. And if you were to paint on the fresco while the mud, while it was still uh, wet, the, the paint would soak into the fresco and it'd become like this really hard, permanent, uh, surface, this really hard permanent painting. Um, so this entire ceiling is made in fresco. So he smeared this mud clay called um, uh, plaster of Paris um, on the ceiling and then he he painted it with watercolors and then as it dried um, it became a very permanent part of the building and so it's part of the wall. It's not uh, something that's painted on top of a wall. Okay, so here is, this is a mural that is in the Pope's house, which um, you saw on that map. So this is another fresco, and this was painted by an artist named Raphael. And again, he used this mud mud called a fresco that he smeared on the wall and then he painted it with watercolors so it became this really permanent part of the wall and because of that the, the colors stay really vibrant and bright and the paint doesn't chip off um, and it's because the paint and the wall are the same thing so as long as the wall doesn't get moved around or there's no earthquakes that'll crack the wall um, this kind of painting lasts a really really long time So how they would do it is they would uh, first draw or sketch 
um, the, the picture that they were gonna do, and then they would one little piece at a time, they would cover it with plaster, um, the, the mud, and then they would paint that section. So it was painted section by section. And this is because fresco uh, dries very quickly. So depending on how much humidity and moisture is in the air where you live, uh, your fresco will dry at different rates. So it's usually between 12 and 24 hours. So once you put that fresco on the wall, um, you have to paint it really quickly in order to uh, make it permanent because once it dries, it's, it's dried. There's no like adding to it. So you kind of have to figure out your design ahead of time and you have to get it um, up and onto the wall uh, quickly. All right. Now I'm going to talk to you. So now this is uh, the recipe that we are going to use to make our fresco. Um, so this is the recipe. We're going to go ahead and get these things all together. So you've got one cup of flour. You've got half a cup of salt. You've got a half a cup of water. And three quarters of a tablespoon of oil. Okay. And then you've got a bowl to mix it in with a nice kind of flat spatula um, or a spoon or a knife or something that'll work to mix it. Okay. So um, that's all we're going to need for making the fresco. And then we are going to make this kind of clay substance and we are going to put it into um, like a paper dish. I've got a paper plate that I'm going to be putting my fresco into. Um, and I mean, you can use it the, the side of a cereal box. You can use um, really anything, but once it dries, it gets very hard and you can't really take it out or remove it, okay? So whatever you put it in, just know that it's gonna kind of permanently be in there. So don't use uh, one of your parents' good dishes, okay? Alrighty, so now I'm gonna exit the screen share and we're gonna make this together. Um, Okay, so hi again. Okay, so I've got uh, the recipe right here. I hope you can kind of, kind of see it. How does that look? Can you, can you see that? Okay, good. So I'm just going to get my flour, get my flour in. And I'm going to pour in my salt. Okay, and I'm going to mix. I'm going to mix those two things together first. So that's just my flour and my salt. Just mix it together until it starts to just look like one mixture. And I can't tell the difference between the flour and the salt anymore. And now I'm going to add my oil. Mix that around a little bit, not too much. And now I'm going to add my water, but I'm only going to add my water a little bit at a time. Because really all I want is just enough water added to make it so that it'll all stir and all stick together. So I have the recipe right here. It is one cup flour, a half cup salt, half a cup of water, and three quarters of a tablespoon of vegetable oil. And so I mix the flour and the salt together first. And now I'm just adding water. And I don't want to add too much water. It's okay if you don't use your entire half a cup of water. Um, I'm just adding just enough water until everything mixes together. It looks kind of like a dough and there's no more flour. So I'm starting to get there, I'm getting close. This is 
little bit more. So this plaster takes a few dries days to actually fully dry. Um, it's a little different than what they would have used, but I wanted to try and pick some ingredients to make one that you had ingredients for at home versus um, the actual the actual stuff that they used. And so the actual plaster that they would use is called uh, plaster of Paris. And what it is is it's um, a lime powder. And lime is made up mostly of calcium. And our bones have calcium in them. Um, and it's just a substance that is found in nature, all right, so that is, um, so calcium is a substance that's found in nature and they use it for all kinds of things. They use it for, um, if you've ever broken a bone or know somebody who's broken a bone that had to get a cast. So they make those out of plaster and um, they also use plaster, like when you're painting a room and there's like holes or cracks, they'll use it to fix those holes and cracks in the wall. Um, they use plaster to make molds. They even use it um, to make uh, statues. So, and you could, if you wanted to, use this plaster recipe to make a um, statue. Okay, so now I've got my plaster and it's just sticking together. So I don't wanna add any more water to it. And I am going to get my, my wall, which is just a paper plate. I'm not actually going to put this on my wall. It would make, it would stick to your wall, um, but it would be very permanent. And I don't know that your parents would be very happy about that if, if they did that. So now I'm just going to squish it in and make sure I fill my whole plate. Okay, and now it's kind of filling the whole plate, but it's not going to work very well if it's all bumpy like this. Clean off my table a sec. Okay, so if I just get my little spatula here, I just kind of dip it in the water. Now I'm just going to smooth this out. You could do this with a rolling pin, I suppose. Um, you could roll it out if you wanted to. I like to squish it out into a nice flat surface for coloring and drawing on. I want to squish all of the bubbles and cracks out, get a nice as flat as you possibly can. Now, since this is not uh, actual like plaster of Paris, um, it will dry a little bit bumpy. So you want to get it as smooth as you possibly can, and that'll help it dry smoother. So I'm getting this all smoothed out here. And is this edible? Yeah, you could eat this. Um, it would taste disgusting. It's got salt and flour and water. That's all that's in here. So um, I don't I don't recommend it. This isn't a very this isn't yeah would not be delicious, but you could try it. Go for it. If you do try it, let me know what you think. All right, almost there. Almost smooth.
here. Okay. So once you get your picture all smoothed out, which I'm pretty happy with how this is looking. Now it's just kind of flat. I don't know if you can really see it, but it's just flat. I tried to get out all the bubbles. I tried to get up, um, make it as flat as I could. Okay. So there is my dough. Um, next, so what a, a Renaissance artist would have done is first, before they even made this, they would have gone out and looked at pictures of things. I'm gonna put this recipe down. Let me get right now. They would have gone out and they would have found a picture of something. Um, they would have found the real thing and they would have looked at it and they would have studied it and they would have really looked at how it looks and all the colors and all the shapes. So I got a, like a, a picture of something. Um, I wanna draw a flower today. Uh, you can draw whatever you would like in your painting, um, but this is what, kind of what they would have done. So they would have found the real thing and they would have studied it carefully. And what they would have done is they would have sketched it out in pencil, just on paper. Um, and they and just like small size, they wouldn't have made it big and um, for like their walls or their ceilings. Um, but they would have sketched it and sketched it and sketched it until they were really happy with how it looked and they would have um, drawn it that way. And then they would have painted it. Um, they would have painted it small scale because they would have wanted to practice uh, what it's going to look like when you put in all the colors. Um, so they would have uh, painted it. Um, and I imagine that their, their floors might have been covered with balled up pieces of paper as they were sketching and painting because they wanted to get it just right. And then after they had painted it and drawn it and gotten it to be just right, they would make it really, really big or life size. And that was called a cartoon. Um, and it was just like a line drawing of it. So um, it would be just the shape and they would just focus on like the outside lines and they called that a cartoon, um, but it would be life size. So it'd be the exact same size as the, the picture that they were gonna paint on the wall. So this would be a good time for somebody like Michelangelo who was drawing his pictures on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. This would have been a good time for him to draw it in pencil and then, you know, put it up there um, with, with some tacks or tape or something that would help it stick um, that they had in that time period. I don't think they had tape. And, um, and then he could have gotten down on the ground and looked at it to see if he had gotten everything correct. And if he didn't get it right, he might have fixed it. So he would have done that over and over and over again until he had it exactly the shapes that he wanted. And then he would use something called a perforating wheel. And I have one, this is a perforating wheel. So it's got all these little tiny pokes, pokey spots on it. And he would have taken his sketch to his wet plaster. He would have put it over top. And he would have just very carefully sketched it out like that, okay? And then when he pulled it away, you would be able to see in the clay his, his drawing and his picture. And then he would have been able to follow those little lines and um, make that picture. So if you ever look at a fresco from that time period or any fresco really, and you look really carefully, you can see little tiny holes that they used as guide marks so that they knew where to draw things because they don't want to make a mistake because here you have your press fresco and this is going to dry very quickly so you don't want you don't have time to make mistakes you can't go back and fix it later so we got to get it right the first time and so you would do that with lots of sketching and lots of practice and really studying what you were going to draw um, we're not going to do that exactly today. We're just kind of going to freestyle it um, because this is more of just a learning class. So 
rather than doing that, I'm just going to look at a picture of something that I want to draw. And I am just going to start painting into my fresco right now because it is wet and it is ready to be painted into. Okay? And so these are my watercolors and they come in little tubes and I just squeeze them out into the little pockets and then add water to them. Um, you can buy these at the art store. You probably have uh, watercolors that are maybe already in a palette um, and that is fine. If you don't have watercolors and you just have regular paint, if you add more water to it, it kind of turns more into a watercolor um, consistency. So, and I am going to uh, draw this flower in my watercolor. What are you going to make pictures of? <laughs> April says that she didn't quite get her mixture right and she doesn't have any more salt. Um, you can try making it with just flour and water. I did uh, make a recipe that was like that. It doesn't end up as smooth um, and it's a little bit more sticky, but it does work. Um, so you can go ahead and try that. All right. And I also included, there's a, my backdrop, my virtual background is some flowers and a sunset. Um, those are very pretty things that you can draw in a watercolor. Um, Mother's Day is on Sunday and my mom really likes flowers. So I thought, hey, what the heck? I'm going to make some flowers and I won't send it to her because she does not live here. But it's the thought that counts, right? So I'm just going to start by painting into my fresco. And it's always easy when you're doing a watercolor to start with the lightest color and then add to it as you go. Um, especially if you're doing a fresco, you wouldn't want to add darkest colors first. They would be hard to paint over. And if you have a hair dryer, you can help this grow, or you can help it dry quickly. And we are done. But for now, you're just going to paint into it. And something really cool about it, as it dries, which you'll hopefully get to um, witness, is it shrinks. Um, so it does not stay the same size. It shrinks a little bit as it dries. So um, this is the one that I made before and I had it coming clear out to the edges of this paper plate and now it's shrunk in about an inch. And um, as it did that, it kind of shrunk all the colors that were on it. So it, it's more, it's like darker, deeper colors than it was whenever I first painted it. So kind of a cool, cool effect. All right. All right. And I just have a little bit of paper towels right here. I like to, um, I don't like to mix my colors too much if it's not on purpose. Um, so I like to dab my brush off in between. Okay. Something I really like way, about poppies is they've got these kind of cool um, dark centers. I kind of really like that. If you 
ever seen a painting on a wall before. Um, I want to teach you a definition. So a mural is any painting that's on a wall. So um, whether it's a fresco or a just kind of paint on paint, that is a mural. Um, but a mural could be done with, like you could just get um, some paint and go draw on a wall and that could be a mural or you could get some spray paint and go spray uh, pictures on a wall like a graffiti or something and that is a mural. Um, fresco is a mural, it's a painting on the wall, but a fresco is a specific kind of mural because it is not something that is um, separate from the wall. It is a part of the wall. It's not going to chip off. It's not going to flake off. It is part of the wall. So, um, so, so a fresco is a mural, but not all murals are frescoes. That's the lesson. Mm -hmm. Forget-me-nots. Oh, those are pretty. I love forget-me-nots. Someone's making a dog. Someone's painting their hand. You can use cardboard instead of a paper plate. Yep, you just kind of can smear it on the cardboard. Um, yes, you could put plaster over top of dried fresco and paint over it. Um, a good question. That would be if you made a mistake, you basically have to go back to step zero and start all over if you're making a fresco wall. So that's why it's so important um, to practice and get your design exactly how you wanted it and to really think it through and plan it out because you don't get um, there's not a lot of um, forgiveness when it comes to fresco kind of stuck with whatever whatever painting you start with I'm sure you would run into things where you had a whole plan and then once you start going, you kind of make a mistake, but rather than having to go back and make your whole painting all over again, you kind of just change your plan just a little bit so that your mistake is no longer a mistake. And when Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling, he did fresco like this, lying on his back. So I'm sure it was a very messy, messy job.
I'm just going to add some more color. Like I said, you kind of start light and you just kind of add to it as you're going. Now when fresco is really, really fresh, when you first put it on there, there's a, there's a little bit of time where you can almost just kind of get like a wet cloth or a wet paper towel and um, clean off the watercolor from the plaster. But um, you can't, you can't uh, clean it off for too long because it dries. All right, guys, and we are getting close to being out of time. Um, so we are getting there. So I'm just going to kind of add the middle of my painting here. Pop these, have these dark centers that are really cool looking. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. I'm going to try and answer them before we're over. Someone's doing a, my painting looks like a cherry, an upside down cherry. Uh, alrighty. Would watercolor brush pens work? I don't know that those would work because they would have uh, pointy tips. Um, and they might squish into your paint just a little bit too much. So really having a, a liquidy paint is kind of important. Just watercolors working. A little bit too much darkness on mine. I don't like it that much. I'm gonna try and clean it off like a tiny little if you're quick. You can clean it off. All right. So that is that. Do just a little bit more. If you would like to send me your uh, pictures, I would love to see what you draw, what you make. You can email them to events at delphian.org or you can direct message them to our social media accounts and um, they will get shared to me that way as well. And um, this is my copy, and this was my inspiration. Um, I can't really tip it because the, the paint on it will drip, but that is, that is fresco. And uh, I had a lot of fun. I hope you guys had some fun too. Um, I wanted to tell you about, there's this book that Heron Books is selling um, right now. It is uh, called Natasha's Sketchbook, and it's a a, basically like a dictionary of art terms and there's a lot of uh, really cool things that you can learn about art just by learning what the words are. You can get 30% off that book right now um, by using Delphian 30 that's a special coupon code. So go ahead and go to heronbooks.com if you want to get that sketchbook and that's all for me and if you would like to send me your art again the email as is events at delphian.org and um, I'll be back next week to do more art. Thank you guys. Have a nice, have a nice weekend. <laughs>